This is Resilient Radio Podcast. I am your host, Daphne Wallace, and I'm also a person in recovery from substance abuse, mental illness, and trauma. We are building up a resilient recovery support community, shining a light for anyone listening that might be needing some help and to know that they're not alone. By doing this, we also provide education and resource options for those in poverty lacking support. In order to break the stigma associated with mental illness and addiction, for those out there seeking recovery, we believe we have to be heard and we have to connect with others on the same mission. We are stepping out and putting forth effort, and so far on this journey, we have come across some compelling stories of resilience, like our guests today. We have Victor Estrada from Washington. Victor is a warrior in recovery, fighting addiction on the front lines of this war on drugs. Estrada is an active board member of Recovery Alliance and Homeless Outreach. He uses social media to connect with those seeking support and resources. It wasn't an easy road for Victor finding purpose in this life. His past consisted of so many things that left him feeling like he was destined to nothing more than criminal activity, addiction, and even prison. Now we welcome Victor Estrada. Thank you. My parents, you know, I grew up in a middle-class family in the suburbs of L.A. Um, And every weekend, my parents would go four-wheeling, and they would always hand me drinks. And uh, they would be like, here, hold this real quick, and, you know... I was, no, I still remember, I was probably in kindergarten, so about five years old, six years old, I would I would take the drinks and I would hold them and then I would be curious, I'd sip on them, you know, end up finishing one of them and then I would open them up and then hand them, hand them a new one. Before, you know, after after taking a drink of, of, of the beer court, weekend it was the same thing. We'd go for willing, everybody would drink, they call the parents and all the all the kids, the younger ones, you know, um, we were drinking, you know, and... It was just something that, like, our parents laughed about. You know, we'd get to feeling drunk and, like, we start stumbling around. Or, you know, um, yeah. I, I still remember pictures growing up, you know, that uh, me on top of uh, my godfather's blazer, you know, with the, I'd be the youngest one with a beer in my hand, and the older kids would have, like, bottles of vodka and tequila in their hands. You know, and it was just, like, for us, it was we were growing up, we were having fun, you know. Um, and and it, it started off just like that, you know, um, and then it progressed. My mom, my mom sold, you know, and grew uh, marijuana, and I wanted to know what it was like, so I would sneak into her purse and take her her roaches and smoke them in the backyard and then get scared and start coughing and run back in the house and try to cover up in, under my blankets, you know, and, and just, like little by little, like my, my disease started to progress. You know, I liked the way I felt. You know, and it started off as just like, okay, this is fun. This is, you know, this is like, um, uh, I'm thinking of the word. It's like a, a, a taboo, you know. Yeah. So growing up, you know, you know, I grew up in a, in a, like I said, in a middle class area, but there was like gangs around my area. There was like, you know, we all grew up together. We all started off tagging, you know, and tagging was like graffiti. We did a lot of like graffiti art, street art. You know, and it, and that became a, like a competition. It was about fame. Who was who was up the most? You know, like whose name was up the most all over LA County? You know, and from mm-hmm. tagging, it, it went into gangbanging. You know, and when I started gangbanging, it was it was probably around thirteen, fourteen years old. You know, I got I got jumped into a gang, and, and it just became the life. You know, it was something that I glorified. I I, I lived for. I you know I would die for. You know, and uh, my disease was already there. So, you know, I was drinking every weekend. I started smoking PCP at a young age. I started selling PCP, and I learned, like, I, I think I just talked about this in the last the last uh, time we tried to, you know, um, record this. You know, at a young age, I knew how to hustle. I, I, I started off in elementary school selling, you know, bazooka bubble gum that was marked at five or three cents. I was selling for five cents so I could buy more. And, I, you know, I, so I had a hustle at a young age, you know, and it was, it was so when I started – you know, on the streets, I always had a hustle. You know, when I was tagging, I was going and I was stealing any utensil you could use for graffiti. I would steal it and I would go to the bus station and I would sell it to other taggers. You know, um, and then next thing you know, once I got involved with gangs, it was like, I don't care what happens. Um, you know, I, I just want to have fun. You know, whether I was, you know, shooting at people, getting shot at, you know, getting stabbed, stabbing people, you know, I really didn't care. You know, um, by the time I was 15, I knew I had a problem drinking, and I told my parents, like, I, I need help, and I ended up in treatment at 15 years old. Um, and when I went to treatment, I, I felt like I didn't want to be around these little kids that were in the adolescent unit I was in. Yeah. So I, I threatened I threatened the staff there and told them, like, look, you just seen who my homies were. They just came to visit. If you don't take me 
out of here and put me in a dog unit, they're going to come shoot this place up. So within an hour, I was moved over to this dog unit, you know, um, and pretty much doing whatever I wanted to do. I was running to the store, grabbing cigarettes for people, you know, going and buying candy, gum, sodas, everything that we couldn't have in treatment, I was bringing it back in, you know, um, and that was my first time in treatment, you know, um, and as I got a little bit older, you know, 16, 17, I was, I was always incarcerated. You know, I was looking at a lot of time, different, different occasions, you know, um, one of my, my, my first serious cases, you know, I was, I was fortunate enough to beat it. You know, I was looking at 16 years when I was 15 years old, you know, um, by the time I was 17, you know, the, you know, the judge had had enough of me and was ready to put me away for a while. My dad asked for another chance. He's like, your honor, you know, you keep locking my son up and it's not working. Let me move my son out of state and give him a second chance. So the judge agreed with, with my dad, you know, my parents moved to Vegas and, um, as soon as I got out there, you know, I, I wanted to do good, but I was still drinking. My parents would leave every weekend. So, uh, you know, I got, I felt isolated. I felt alone. And I, you know, that was my first attempt at suicide. You know, um, I didn't, I didn't know how to live without the chaos, you know? Um, so when my parents found, like, they took me back to California for New Year's Eve and my aunt happened to notice like cuts on my wrist and she told my parents and I ended up in a mental hospital and then from the mental hospital I ended up in treatment again. You know, and, and I was just, I was scared. I, I, I was, I was so used to living a lifestyle that was just something you see in the movies. You know, like, oh, I look at how this kid grew up. It was like, I grew up and I chose a different way to live and I, and I chose the wrong way. You know, um, I've always been a smart, intelligent person, you know, and my parents used to always tell me like, you know, you can go to college and you could be something big. You could do something with your life. And I used to just like lap it off and be like, nah, I'm just, just I'm, I'm destined to die at a, at a young age, you know. Um, right. So, so when I was 17 and I moved to Vegas, you know, um, I found this new drug uh, for me. It was, you know, it was, it was meth. And um, I, I tried it the first time. It didn't affect me. The second time I mixed it with some Coke and I was, I was in love. You know, I could stay up for multiple days at a time. And it was just, it was like, to me, it was like the best feeling ever. You know, I was motivated. I had energy to do whatever I wanted to do, you know, um, and then I was still drinking on top of that, but then my hustle started to come back in, you know, and I, I was like, man, I can get high and make so much money off of this stuff. So I just went on to like be a little businessman you know, out there in the streets of Vegas, you know, um, and, and I, I used to make a lot of money and I used to waste a lot of money and I, I wasted a lot of it gambling. I picked up another addiction while I was out there in active addiction, you know, um, so from that, you know, by the time I was, 20 years old, my, my girlfriend at the time was pregnant with my, with my oldest. And, you know, all I knew how to do was hustle. I had tried to work and it was, you could never make enough money working at a regular job when I think back then minimum wage was like four twenty five an hour, you know, and I was used to living this fast life with lots of money, you know, that I could just splurge and do whatever I wanted. So I, I kept selling drugs you know, up until my daughter was born, you know, um, and when my daughter was born, her mom went to jail, and I just figured, like, okay, I can continue doing this, continue selling drugs. I can take care of this kid by myself. And I, one of my friends was there helping me. Like, we did shifts of, like, who was going to sell from this time to this time, and then we would shower, and then one person would take care of the baby while the other one was selling, selling drugs. And one day I just happened to leave my daughter at her aunt's house, and, um, I get a phone call like the next day and then they're like, your daughter just got taken away. You know, you need to come and find out what's going on. So I pulled up to my house and, and my, my dad and my brother-in-law were like, get out of here. The cops just left, you know? Um, so, um, I ended up going to jail shortly after that. And when I was in jail, they told me that I would never see my daughter again, you know, and, and my heart was just broke. Like, I don't, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to be a dad. I was scared. Um, so when I got out of jail, I, I went on this, this suicide mission, you know, to, to die. Like, there's no purpose in living. You know, what's the point in, in continuing? And um, so I went on, on, on a binge for 29 days, and I, I went from 185 pounds to 117 pounds 29 days later. You know, um, and I was in a, I, I'm pretty sure I was in a mess into psychosis because I literally thought everybody was trying to kill me. I thought my mom was trying to kill me. I thought my sister was trying to kill me. You know, um. So from treatment, I ended up in detox, um, or from the hospital, I ended up going to detox a few days later, you know, after staying with my mom, you know, um, once I got into detox, I started to get a little bit healthier from, from detox. I ended up sitting at a treatment center every day for, 
for like eight, like eight in the morning till five in the afternoon. Every day they'd like, Victor, there's no bed today. You know, you can go home. And so I would come back the next morning and I just, I, I wanted to live. I, I knew there was something better in life for me than just getting loaded. You know, um, so I finally get in the treatment, you know, and as when I get there, you know, I still think the cops are out to get me. So my, my counselor calls the, the drug, the, the DEA and says, uh, Hey, are you guys looking for this, this this young man named Victor Estrada? And they were like, they were like, no. Kind of cleared my conscience a little bit, and then about a week later, my my counselor calls me in and says, "Hey, um, the lady that has custody of your kid uh, wants to, you know, bring your daughter here to visit you." And I was like, "Are you serious?" And so I started seeing my daughter pretty regularly. I started like me and my family would go see my daughter, and um. It started to become a normal thing, you know. It was like, you know, daughter's back in my life. There's hope, you know. I want to do this. And at the same time, I was scared. I was scared to be a failure. I was scared to, to, to let my daughter down. And sure enough, you know, I left treatment. Um, I ended up back in the hometown where I was at. And um, within a matter of, I want to say a month, maybe a month and a half, I was I was drinking, and the first night I drank, I instantly called and got some dope, and I was back out there again. And like a month later, I you know I get, I made a decision to give my daughter up for adoption, and let the family that had her adopt her, you know, um, with the agreement that I would always be a part of my daughter's life, and that I would always be able to see her, and she would always know who I was. And as soon as I went to prison for the first time, they completely cut me off. Um, no response ever from any letters I wrote, pictures I sent. You know, presents that were sent from my family. Any nothing was like there was no contact. You know, so for my whole life, you know, that I was out there, as I was in active addiction, I'll say for with my drug of choice, um, as for 24 years. You know, and in that 24 years, you know, I, I always thought that I got high because I loved the lifestyle, because I loved the money, because I loved the, you know going to prison. You know, I, I used to think that that was my destiny. You know. Um, I would I would sit in the prison cell and I would pace back and forth, back and forth, and I would ask my higher power, God, like God, what is my purpose in life? Is this what I'm destined to be? Like, is this is this really it? You know, and and I never heard an answer. You know, and, and they say your higher like what I've heard is that like your higher power speaks to two people. You know, so 2014, I get out of prison. You know, and it's my my third time in prison in Washington State. You know, I did a total of eight and a half years. You know, um. And it was just like, man, I can't keep doing this to myself. So I decided I wanted to get clean one day, you know, and I, and I went back to my family's house and, and I told them, I'm like, look, I'm ready to try something different, you know, and I stopped, I stopped using my drug of choice, but I, I drank, I drank for a couple of weeks, you know, and then finally I, you know, one of my friends reached out to me on social media and was like, dude, you should get back in the meetings. You've been there before. You know how to do this. You know how it feels, you know, give it a shot, you know, um, so I walked into the you know the rooms of a twelve step program in 2015, and um, and you know I, I tell I tell people I'm an addict, and people kind of like feared the way I looked. I'm, I'm guessing, you know, because um, I ended up talking about it about a month later. But um, so anyways, I start going to these meetings and I'm, I'm making a daily routine of it, and um, I get into a conversation on the phone, ends up getting turned into I get I go meet up with somebody, get into a fight with them. You know, um, and it just, it, it could have been a really bad incident, but I'm grateful there was these cameras in this parking lot to stop me from doing something really stupid, yeah. you know, because I'd probably be doing a life sentence right now if there wouldn't have been them cameras, you know. So I go home and I drink and I call my friend up and I'm like, look, this just happened. I just had a couple beers and she's like, this is your new clean day, you know, March 26, 2015, hold on to it. You don't ever have to use again, you know, um. So the next day we went to a meeting and I've been clean ever since. So I got a little over, so I got four years, five months and maybe three days, four years. Yeah. Four years, five months, three or four days, That's awesome. you know? Yeah. And my life today is just, is just, is just awesome. You know, right now I'm sitting over at a recovery house with, with a young, a young guy in recovery. And we're working on this T-shirt design and this T-shirt that I've been putting out there, uh, make recover the epidemic, you know, and, and something that we talked about. We were talking, we we're sitting in a, in a, you know, in a, we were sitting in a board retreat for Washington Recovery Alliance, and you know, the 
the chairperson was like, hey, you know what? You know, all these people are dying because of the opioid epidemic and, and the meth epidemic and everybody's dying. She's like, why don't we just make recovery the epidemic? You know, and I instantly said, I said, why don't you let me use that as a hashtag and put it on social media? So we, we did that. We put it on social media and, and it started to grow. And, you know, I was like, okay, let's take it to another level. Let's make some hats. Let's make some shirts. You know, so, so I've been pumping out. I just pumped out some hats, you know, and it's getting recognition. Like I've, there's people on the East Coast, on the West Coast, like Arizona, you know, out, out to Chicago, you know, wearing these hats, you know, and people are taking pictures with them. And I just, I just sent out a couple of shirts today, like to Massachusetts, dude. Like I want to be the first one to represent on the East Coast. Yeah. You know, I had another guy hit me up from Texas. He's like, dude, he's like, let's do this. Let's make recover the epidemic. You know, and, and it's, you know, I got tired of like living a life that was just nothing. You know, I lived a life that I thought was, you know, glamorous, and it wasn't. It was miserable. I was, I hated myself. I hated everybody around me. You know, and I, I work a twelve step program, so right now I'm, I'm on that step. You know, making amends. You know, and. You know, and I made amends to my family members I needed to make amends to, and I made amends to my daughter, you know, and me and my daughter are really in on talking terms right now, and, and, you know, she didn't respond to my amends letter, and that's okay, you know, because I, I'm, I'm doing my part to help heal myself, you know, and anybody can heal themselves, you know, it's just how far are you willing to go, you know, I tell people like that all the time, I tell them, I'm like, you know, you know, how, how willing are you, you know, you show me some willingness and I'll show you some results, I'll show you some solutions. You know, because I've wasted a lot of time trying to help people that were just there because they wanted to get clean for a few days, you know, and, and, you know, save a little bit of money and go back out and get loaded again. So it got pretty to the point where it was, like, hard to help people. Yeah. You know, and it was like, man, I felt like I was being used. And then I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to start helping the ones that are willing because the, the program that I work, you know, the, the three of the things that are indispensable are honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. You know, mm-hmm. so I, 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 see how, I see how open-minded people are when I give them suggestions. You know, and if they show you the willingness to take them, you know, and they're honest with what they're doing, then I, I'm going to help them out. Right. You know, me. you know, people that come into transition and are ready for recovery, the next step in recovery, and they're ready to find, you know, to pursue their purpose. And, you know, that that's the transition area is, is my area. I feel like I can make the most difference and um, not qualified you know, not not just not qualified, but at the same time, because I'm not qualified to be on the ground level, you know, and help people act in active addiction. I thought that's where I was going to be. And then when I had went through some experiences, I realized how how vulnerable I am in that position in many different ways. So I've done the same thing, Victor. I had to realize, you know, where my place is. And I believe everybody's got a place in helping in this entire epidemic and situation and in addition to what you what you've done yourself and all the hard work that you've done what do you think could be impossibly in the communities or justice system even or some kind of changes that can help some of the stuff that's happening right now like out here in in in, in my area in my state is they're doing like a an LFO forgiveness, like legal financial obligation forgiveness like like when I got charged I mean convicted on my charges for, you know, deliveries of meth and possession of meth, I also got hit with, like, a $3,000 extra fine for meth manufacturing, even though I was at manufacturing. So what they're doing is they're, they're looking at stuff like that to try to give people some relief for their crimes. Like, I, I owe $40,000 right now, and if, if I'm paying $25 a month on each case, I'm going to be paying for the next 40 years, you know. Right. And it's, that, that doesn't make it impossible for somebody to get back on their feet and, and live life, you know. So that's something that we're working on. You know, uh, drug courts are a big thing out here right now. You know, I'm, I actually get to work and talk with the drug court judge out here. You know, um, I reached out to her through social media and was like, hey, i seen this interview you did. I'm really interested. I'm talking to you face-to-face and see what you really want to do to make a difference. Right. So we sat down, you know, and, and it's all of, a lot of it has to do with, you know, advocating. Like, if you want to see change, you have to make, you have to be that person that's going to go to the, to the state capitol. You know, and I've done it for the last two years, like I've literally gone and talked to senators and legislators from my district and was like, hey, these are the, this is who I was and this is who I am today and these are the changes that I've made, you know, and they're just like shocked and they're like, thank you for coming here and tell you my, telling me your story. Indeed. You know, I can, re- I can relate to what you're talking about because I have a family member that's going down the same path that you've been through already. How do uh, we get them help? 
you know, and, and it's, it's more about just being a voice, you know. I, I do a lot through social media. Right. You know, um, you talked about, like, I, I, you know, so we have a page called Can't Go Back. Um, we have a second page called Can't Go Back Live. You know, and I was just talking to my friend the other day. You know, he does he he does it on a bigger scale. Mm-hmm. He does a he does a Chicago Hope Dealers, and I was telling him about you. He's like, dude, he's like, give her my information. I'd love to go do a podcast. Yeah. You know, so you know, if you want his information, well, you know, we Absolutely. can talk about that afterwards. Yeah. But he's like one of them dudes that's like he's got he's got viewers around the world. You know, yeah. I'm still like on a on a nationwide level and this dude is like expanded it to like get out there and, and he does shows six days a week right. you know and that's how we make changes that's how we show people that it's possible you know a lot of people always talk about you know i can't find a job i'm a felon you know um and, I, and that's i used to be that person that used to say that until i got a job you know doing what i'm doing um so you know I, I do homeless i do homeless outreach you know, and I work for a non a non profit organization, but they gave me a chance because, you know, I I have lived experience. Okay, so when you were on your way to trying to find the path that you're supposed to be on, did you know what you were doing? No. So I didn't people just step out there. So everybody listening you know, sometimes it, it like Victor said, it's gonna take you doing it. You may not know what you're doing. Half of us don't. You know, we we started up this podcast show trying to help make a difference. You know, you got people throwing recovery festivals, people doing like Victor with the T-shirts, people speaking where they can, sharing their story. You can make a difference wherever you are. You do not have to know the next step. You just got to be willing sometimes to step out there and try. So one thing I was thinking, because you mentioned something to me the other day in a text message about how you want to, like, get some more better equipment and you want to be able to go on the road and do, like, better interviews on, for the podcast. Absolutely. So... Somebody, did, I'm gonna have to go back and look through my posts from the first podcast we did because I told somebody I was doing a podcast. You know, I'm like, hey, doing my first podcast with, with you know somebody, and they were like, they were they were like giving me links like how to get better equipment. And I'm like, oh no, I'm not doing it myself. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can't find that post. You know, I, I, I post a lot of stuff, so I'll be digging through for it. But thank you because you know, anything helps. You know, we'll just. If we can give somebody some shortcuts, some people that really are sincere about wanting to change their life, you know, then it can make a difference. Because I know, with, you know, sometimes you have to go through lessons, but sometimes, like for me, I prayed and I wish somebody had came sooner. Because I had a lot of my life that was wasted of me trying to find the way out because I had no knowledge, you know. I don't know how big you are on social media. I mean, I, I've gone through your page and I've, I've looked at the Zillion Radio page, mm-hmm. you know. Definitely, when this comes out, there's, you're going to have more followers. Yeah. I can guarantee you that. You know, and, and if if you want, you can check out the Chicago Hope Dinners page too. You know, and, and like just you'll see how they do it live every night, except for Sundays. Yeah. But just like how they get it on there and they'll pull people on. And, and if you want to tell your story, you you can go on there and tell your story too. You know, a few years ago, I remember I was in a place to where I thought I was like the only person on the earth that was caring, that cared about recovery and and who was trying to make a difference and i thought i was the only person that struggled like i did and it took me a while but i kept you know working toward it i felt by myself and you know leaning on my higher power which is god and i literally moved states and i went to tennessee from mississippi and uh, me and my children and when i got there i started you know trying my best to connect with people and and figure out what we're going to do and uh, I, i got connected with an awesome team and you know, I started having help ever since, and I started, doors started opening, I started seeing more, uh, finding my purpose in it, you know, and it was just a change. It was something that I never, never thought was going to happen, but I had hope for it to happen, and I remember sitting in a peer recovery specialist class, and when I got in there, it it took everything I had not to cry, because when I went in there, and once I sat in there, and and that 20-something people all around that room, including the instructors. I was sitting in that class, and I realized when we started introducing ourselves that every single person at that table struggled with a mental illness or addiction or knew somebody that did, you know, connecting with other people. And I believe that's why it's so important that we need changes to be made and we need to have all the support we can get to, to elevate what's happening in this area because the more help we get the more hope people can see that's what i believe yeah 
Yeah, it, it's crazy. Like, when I was sitting at the state capitol, you know, just to hear, like, senators and legislators talk about that, like, man, I have a nephew that's struggling right now with addiction. I have another, you know, another person, like, I have a son that is, is struggling with opioids right now. You know, how, what can we do to change and what can we do to help? Like, asking us, you know, recovering addicts, like, how can we help you help them? You know, and it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's getting passed, you know, and it's, so uh, it's and, and this is just, this is just the beginning, you know, and, and I look forward, like I, when I came into the rooms that I'm in, you know, the 12 step program I'm in, you know, they told me like, this is a lifelong program. And I'm like, I think I can deal with that. You know, <laughs> I, I, I did my drug of choice for 24 years and I, and I, and I, and I was gangbanging for, for 28 years. Like I can do this if, you know, if I really want it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, if anybody wants to connect with Victor, you can go to can't was it can't go back, and I'm going to put a uh, a link or something on there, or you know, reminder, some tidbit about your t-shirts you're doing when I put the post out, and y'all can connect with him to order your t-shirts. I'm going to order mine soon. Y'all do that, and so if someone that you know or yourself would like to be a guest on this show or submit your story, email client services at tntalk.org. That's client services at tnntalk.org. Your story is so important and you never know whose life it can impact. You've been listening to Resilient Radio Podcast. Join our group on Facebook and check out how we are transforming the social service industry by going to tabiztalk.com. That's T-A-B-I-Z talk.com. Join our newsletter for updates. Thank you so much, Victor, for coming on. And thank you for thank you, everything you do. And I look thank forward you. to connecting with you in the future. And thanks, everybody, for listening to Resilient Radio Podcast, music, community, and love.